Hello? Hey, Tim, can you hear me? Hey, I can. Hello. <laughs> okay, hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good morning, good, team. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Good morning for me. Good, <laughs> good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. You know, we are in the uh, Congress Palace of uh, the Europe Congress Palace where we did the last workshop with your students in 2012. Remember right. that? Yes? I remember. Well, yeah. It's a the, beautiful uh, building. Yeah, we got the, the creek. It's been uh, daylighted already. You know, the Follow the River project. Oh, we're fantastic. On. It's right next to us. So we hope you can oh. join us in person next time. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you, team, uh, to the audience before you start, just to make the presentation so you can go on. It's an honor to have you joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, team? Um, I'm sorry, I can just hear you over the translation. Um. Wait, wait, no <laughs> translation needed. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, um, I'm, Rebecca, did you say begin? Did, should, I, should I start? From the start? Tim, can you hear me? <laughs> She's my... Rebecca is introducing you, Tim. Oh, okay. Hi. Oh, very good. <laughs> I'll be quiet. This there is you are. See you now. This, she's Hi. <laughs> and Rebecca. Hi, Lena. Hi. <laughs> she, she's going to speak right after you. I think you're planning a Biophilic Cities Conference next year in Singapore, right? Yeah. Hopefully you agree to it. <laughs> <laughs> you got some business here. Okay. 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 Uh, I'm just going to introduce you, all right? ¿Estamos traduciendo? Sí, sí, sí. Sí, entonces lo hago en español. Ah, como quieras. Sí. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm so sorry. I, I, um, I, I can only hear the Spanish translation, so I didn't actually hear what you were saying. Uh, Becca, you oh, were introducing me. Tim, she's yes. speaking in English. So there's no need to uh, translate. Well, somehow I'm, somehow I'm hearing the Spanish, and uh, it's... It's 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 drowning out the English, so I can't I can't actually hear what Rebecca was saying, but that's okay. If you want me, to, am I ready to start? Shall I go? You you can go ahead. Uh, just want to introduce later, then. Huh? And now I can't hear anything. Later, okay. Can you hear me? You're ready to go. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good. Okay. Um, so I should begin. See. Um, okay, I'm, uh, shall I start? I can't, I can't see. Can you hear me at all? Yes. Yes. Something's happened. Um, hmm. Pasamos a la presentación. Can you, um, let's see, I don't know what's going on. I think the sound has been turned off. Um, um, has my speaker been turned off? Um, can you hear us? Can you hear me? If you can hear me, can you wave? Loud yes. and clear. Yes. yes. You can hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Okay. All right. I can't actually uh, hear anything in the room, but that's probably okay. That's, that's okay. <laughs> let, me, yeah. let me begin. Um, so it's lovely to be with you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, it's such a lovely city, and we've had such a wonderful uh, relationship with, with it and you. Um, it's fantastic to hear uh, Rebecca about the daylighting of the stream. Uh, can you send me pictures, photographs, yeah, 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 even yeah. today? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that would be wonderful. Okay, I'm going to go to the, to the um, share the screen and start. Um, hopefully this will work. And I don't know what to do if you can't see that. Um, it's taking a second. Um, let's see. Uh, all the... Hmm. Let's try that. Oh. Yes. Okay, hopefully you can see this. And uh, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes or so and, and then uh, stop. I can't actually see you um, at the moment, but I'm um, hoping you can hear me. And if you can't, please somebody send me a text message. Um, but, and I have no audio, so I'm not hearing anything at all from anybody um, <laughs> in the room. But um, so we, we have been promoting this idea of biophilic cities. And uh, there's a, a shot of Singapore. I know Lena will, will tell you all about that wonderful city. I have a few things to, uh, to say. 
about it. It's just it's one of my favorite. It's become one of my favorite places, and one of I think one of our best examples of of a biophilic city. So um, it, the question for a lot of us in in urban planning is uh, what is the future vision of cities as we see the new projections uh, that suggest that uh, we're going to be at 70 percent, almost 70 percent uh, of our of our global population uh, in, in cities by 2050. Uh, what will those cities be like? And we want them to be compact and dense and sustainable and resilient, but we also know that we want them to be natureful. We want them to be places where, that are abundant uh, in, uh, with nature, are biodiverse, and have lots of contacts and connections with the natural world for people living there. We believe that it's not uh, something optional, but uh, absolutely essential to lead uh, a healthy, uh, happy, and meaningful life. Uh, we have to give a lot of credit to E.O. Wilson, uh, Ed Wilson, uh, who uh, wasn't the first person to use the word biophilia, but he sort of coined it in the way that we use it today, this idea that we're, uh, we've co-evolved uh, with the natural world, that we have this innate uh, affiliation or innate connection. We're drawn to, to nature. Uh, a remarkable amount of evidence now about the power uh, of nature. Here's a second quote from Ed Wilson. The human species has grown up in nature. So not a surprise that we are happiest, healthiest, uh, feeling most at ease when we have uh, nature uh, all around us. Um, I have to say that uh, even though there is this innate connection with the natural world. Um, I agree with uh, Stephen Keller, who is a, a hero for a lot of us, who's passed away now, but who used to like to talk about biophilia as, as, this, as a weak genetic tendency, which I think is, is perhaps a little bit negative, but uh, the idea that we have this innate uh, affiliation with the natural world, but it requires some cultivation. Um, these, this is an image from a film that we're making about uh, blue biophilic cities, cities that have connection to water. This is a nature center near Miami, and we filmed this group of fifth uh, graders as they went off into the water, and it was really a, rem a remarkable day. Uh, we have a, a film, if anyone's interested in seeing it, I can tell you how you might see it, but it's it, uh, it was remarkable to see these kids. Most of them live not very far from the water, but they uh, actually had never been in the water, and so in this uh, educational experience, they're given an each, each pair of kids given a net and encouraged to scoop the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the sea there and to pull up what they, to, what they could see or discover. And it was really remarkable. One child lifted their net and saw what looked like uh, an inflated ball. It turned out to be a puffer fish. And then when they put it back in the water, it deflated and it, it became a fish again in their eyes. It was just a wondrous uh, example, a wondrous day, and um, a uh, illustration of how we've got to create in cities opportunities to uh, have direct contact with with nature and the natural world. So it isn't just going to happen uh, automatically. Um, we could spend the whole day talking about the evidence. Uh, it is remarkable. Every every week, it seems we have something new, some new piece of evidence. This is a uh, a bioscience article a couple of months ago. Uh, showing the relationship between um, depression, uh, that if you live in a green, uh, natureful neighborhood, you are more li less likely to be depressed or anxious or uh, experience stress. We know that hearing birdsong, for example, um, has remarkable power. All of the work coming out of uh, Japan over the years around forest bathing, um, you know, suggests this as well. That where we have nature, it, it does has this remarkable. Uh, ability to reduce uh, stress. Uh, the Japanese discovering that after a walk in walk in a forest, uh, stress hormone levels go down. Uh, that walk boosts your immune system. Uh, we're doing actually a lot of forest bathing in other places, including the U.S. now, um, and uh, creating opportunities to to experience nature. Walk in that forest in the city is um, increasingly important. So nature has the ability in cities if we incorporate it, put it at the center. Uh, to to enhance the quality of life and to reduce the stresses of modern urban living. This this is an, uh, a study from uh, Minnesota showing, interestingly enough, that in, at uh, bus stops, transit stations where you have trees around you, 
uh, the perceived waiting times for the, the transit for the bus uh, are lower. So we are happier, we're more content. Uh, it even affects our perception of time uh, in cities in a positive uh, way. So that's, so the evidence is pretty, uh, pretty compelling. And if you look at it all, it's really quite remarkable. I don't have time to go through all of this, but again, it's uh, reduced depression, reduced stress, improved mood, improved happiness, uh, physical activity enhanced in greener neighborhoods, lower crime, uh, what's interesting to me is the way that having nature around us uh, it, it makes us better human beings. We're more likely to be generous, more likely to be cooperative. I like the very last one, increased laughter and joy. We have some evidence about that and a lot of visceral, a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence. And for me, ultimately, it's about creating the conditions for a flourishing urban life. So the word flourishing, not sure what the Spanish uh, word for that is. Uh, is, but it's a powerful word and it captures all these things that we want to have in life and in the places where we live. So we have been advancing this idea of biophilic cities. What is a biophilic city? Uh, and it is uh, uh, m many different things, but it's joining that biophilia and that urban. These are cities that connect us to nature. They also connect us to each other, of course. And I would say a uh, biophilic city is a city that emphasizes biophilic design. Design, it's a city with lots of biophilic buildings, but it's much more than that. It's all of those spaces, the gardens and parks and trees and streams, in the case of Victoria now, uh, and birds and, and urban nature of all kinds between and among and beyond the buildings, if you will, to, to paraphrase Jan Gale a little bit um, there. So uh, it's about connections, connecting us to nature, connecting us to each other, connecting to place. It's also about conservation. It's about a recognizing increasingly that cities have a really important role to play in, in conserving and protecting uh, biodiversity. Uh, Singapore is certainly an example of, of that. Lena will talk more about the wonderful success and model of that city. It's also, there's an ethical dimension to this that relates to coexistence and care. So it's almost a, there's a biocentrism uh, that goes along with this. It's not just about what nature can do for us. It's about making room uh, for nature um, as well. So in 2011 or so, we started something called the Biophilic Cities Project uh, with funding from the Summit Foundation, Washington, D.C.-based foundation. Um, and this is, uh, in 2013, actually, we brought a lot of the representatives to Charlottesville, including Rebecca and Lena. And uh, we launched uh, uh, this global network, Biophilic Cities Network. And Victoria is in it, thank thankfully, and so is Singapore. Uh, the number of cities growing, this map is even a little bit uh, dated. Uh, Fremantle, Western Australia has just joined uh, last, last week. We've just gotten an application from Phoenix. A uh, number of, of cities are joining. So we're quite excited about this and can tell you more about it. We're doing a number of things related to this network. Um, we've started an online journal called Biophilic Cities. We're about to issue the third uh, uh, issue of that journal. You can find it on our, our website, biophiliccities.org. Um, a lot of uh, really uh, cutting edge, uh, articles about cutting edge work in cities around the world. We have started Biophilic Cities or Biophilic Codes uh, uh, initiative, which is about co collecting, comparing, analyzing the different ways that cities um, regulate and manage uh, nature uh, and things like standards for bird safe buildings. These are two Im images from San Francisco, which is our one of our partner cities as well. Uh, they have a, a wonderful bird, uh, bird friendly design guidelines and, and code now. Uh, and the image on the right, actually, they are the first uh, American city to mandate the installation of green rooftops. They have something called a Better Roofs uh, Ordinance, which is quite, quite interesting. We are developing relationships and partnerships with various uh, other organizations. Um, this is an image from last uh, spring. Uh, we joined with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, the Natural History Museum, uh, to organize a Biophilic Cities lecture. Um, Catherine Warner 
uh, is on the right of this picture. She's a sustainability director for the city of St. Louis. And they have uh, done wonderful things lately in promoting the, the um, installation of, of gardens. They have a program called Milkweeds for Monarchs. And uh, 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 the idea of planting butterfly gardens, uh, this is cities really embrace the idea of butterfly gardening. Um, and they have, they set a, a goal of 250 butterfly gardens and they now have 400, more than 400 in the city and, a, and an online map that includes them all. It's really quite, quite remarkable. Here's Singapore. Um, and Lena may t tell you more about this. She appears in one of our first films that we made, uh, about a 50-minute film about Singapore. It has about 100,000 views at this point, but we're trying to make at least one film about each of our partner cities, and, and all of those are on our YouTube channel if you're interested. There's a new one uh, for Edmonton, Canada, and we're working on several several others. So we spent a fair amount of time thinking about what it is that uh, a biophilic city looks like and feels like um, and the qualities of a biophilic city. And it's, uh, it's a multi-scaled, we like to say it's something that represents a whole of city approach. So it's those biophilic buildings and it's the interior spaces bringing nature inside, but it's uh, all of the other spaces, all, all of the other scales from the rooftop or the room all the way out to the region or the bioregion and, and all the spaces in between. This is an image of Helsinki uh, with an integrated multi-scaled um, uh, gr green network, which is quite, quite impressive. Here's Singapore again. Um, we love this idea of immersive nature. So we're seeing many of our cities aspire uh, to a, a bolder vision, which is that we don't just want to have nature in a city or we don't just want to have parks that we can walk to in a city. We want to reimagine the, the very nature of a city so that the city is the park, the city is the garden, the city is the forest. And we don't need to necessarily walk to that park. We are living in it and it is all around us and all around the spaces. So, so uh, Lena will tell you more, but the Singapore changing the motto from uh, garden city to city in a garden um, and reimagining just about everything that gets built there. So this is the now famous Park Royal Hotel. Uh, Woha Architects have become a big fan of their work. And so this is part of uh, what we're impressed by in Singapore, a uh, uh, requirement that you replace the ground level nature with vertical nature, all this wonderful innovation when it comes to vertical greening and sky rise greening. So this is more than 200% of the nature lost at ground level and a really wonderful uh, uh, story. So uh, I've been interested to see the friendly competition now between different building owners. This is actually a building uh, designed actually by the same, uh, by Woha as well, um, which I got to see this past November. And it has, uh, it's planted in almost entirely, the, the facade is almost entirely planted with, with vines and flowering vines. And there are, I think, more than 20 species of, of flowers. And so I love this idea that we aspire to cities where, in fact, you have buildings that actually bloom. Um, this is an image from, uh, from November. So this idea of immersive nature is quite compelling to us. And we feel like this is the way we, we need to be uh, going. Um, another, another example, Melbourne uh, have, have adopted a pretty impressive uh, forest urban forest plan with a canopy coverage uh, standard. Uh, they want to double their canopy coverage by 2040. Uh, but most impressively, they uh, are imagining themselves not just as a place where they're going to plant more trees, but as a city and a forest. Uh, really powerful vision. And they've done some very creative things to engage the public, including giving each existing tree its own email address and encouraging residents to send loving emails to their favorite trees. And the, the trees actually will, will um, uh, respond. They'll send an email back. So it's a full, uh, uh, all of city, whole of city approach. It's all a whole of, also a whole of life approach. So we believe um, that you should have nature all around you at an early age and throughout the course of your life and in your elder years as well. This is one example from Atlanta uh, where this is a, a wonderful school. We've just started making a film down there. We filmed a, about a month ago, the Chattahoochee Charter School. So the school is an elementary school that emphasizes nature. 
and emphasizes uh, growing things, growing food. Um, and it's not one building, but a series of buildings. And the kids are ready to go outside at a moment's notice. They, they take their lessons outside. They do their math outside. Um, and they, they're moving around during the day uh, in the outside world. Um, this is very much about rewilding. Uh, so we believe uh, the agenda is about reimagining those spaces again around buildings and rediscovering, for example, the hydrology, the native hydrology of a place. Um, we have one uh, community, uh, uh, one city, Cura uh, de Bat, has just joined the network uh, in San, San Jose. Um, this is a project that's actually more citywide, but a really interesting initiative to create a 25-kilometer long uh, walkway and, and, and restoration project around two rivers that run through the center of the city. So rewilding cities is a big part of what we're uh, talking about. Um, we we want to convert where we can in cities um, things spaces that are gray and and not very full of life and not very biodiverse into things that are full of nature. Um, this is a wonderful story of a, a fairly conventional water feature in Perth in Western Australia. Perth has not yet joined our network, but Fremantle has just just south of Perth. Um, and this is a case of converting a, a, a conventional water feature into essentially a native a wetland. It's a really wonderful story. If you're interested, we have a, a, a five-minute film about it that we've just made this past summer. It's on the YouTube channel uh, as well. But we need to be, again, this is an example of rewilding, uh, creating space for nature in cities, and enhancing the quality of, of life for, for urbanites. But it's uh, a biophilic city is more than just the presence or absence of nature. It is the the engagement that we have as residents, as vis as um, citizens. How involved in that nature are we? How much time do we spend uh, enjoying it, l l uh, being curious about it, being outside? So it's as much about these kinds of things as it is about the presence or absence of nature. Uh, one recent example for us is a new town called Reston, which has just joined our network as well. Uh, some of you may know it. It's just outside Washington, D.C., and it, it was a, a wonderful uh, new town started back in the 1970s, a sort of garden city. And they have uh, now done so much work to engage the, the public in nature that about half the population, when you add it up, people who participate in butterfly counts and dragonfly counts and uh, bio blitzes and things like that, more than half actually of the population engaged, directly engaged in nature, restoring nature, observing nature, citizen science. Uh, that's a really interesting metric. So we also say that um, uh, a biophilic city is a multi-sensory uh, city. So it's not just what you see, it's the full experience of nature. So for us, it's also about the soundscape. So we very much uh, uh, want to appreciate and protect the natural soundscapes of cities. And they're really profoundly important. And I, I illustrate that with birds. So um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to tell whether you hear this or not. Um, but this is a species. I hear it anyway. But this is an eastern wood thrush. And it's my favorite bird. And I hear it every morning and every afternoon here in Virginia, and it takes me immediately back to my childhood. It's beautiful, uh, it's place fixing, it's therapeutic. And of course, we want to celebrate the natural landscapes at the same time that we, uh, we reduce the, the, the impact of, of car tires and jackhammers and all of the other urban noises that are, uh, create health problems for us and also mask the beautiful sounds that we have. Um, every place has a different soundscape. So in our Australian cities, this is one of my favorite sounds. It's an Australian raven, and it sounds a lot like a baby crying. And it's a very distinctive sound and a very lovely sound um, and, and very much associated with that particular uh, place. So, okay. Um, I, I want to say uh, that um, – the nature we have in cities is very diverse, and it depends on where you are. It depends on the climate you're in. It depends on the part of the world you're in. What will make sense in tropical places like Singapore will not make sense in, in a more arid desert environment like Phoenix. Phoenix is just joining our network. I think I mentioned that. Uh, and it's also it's, – it's not just the, the native flora and fauna. 
It's also human design nature, things like green rooftops and green walls. And, and, and the upper left, maybe you know about Mark Granyon, a Spanish designer who's done, done these wonderful uh, um, bus roof roofs that uh, uh, have green, green in them. So we like to think that we like to use this idea of the nature pyramid, what we call a nature pyramid, sort of like a food pyramid, um, to show the kinds of nature that we could have at different scales. Uh, with the important point being that at the base of this pyramid is where you want to have the bulk of your nature diet, so-called. Um, and all this is one actually that Singapore has done um, a version of it, uh, so that we we can't afford for everybody to travel far away. The carbon footprint of traveling to some distant nature is is too high for that to be the main source of your urban nature. So it's all the things around you. It's that immersive nature. It's that green wall. It's the birds flying by. It's the the trees, the the, the street trees. It's all of that nature. It's that that daylit to stream um, in Victoria. So uh, all those things together constitute the the daily or hourly nature, ideally. So um, every city that we have in our network has unique opportunities to restore nature. Um, this is uh, an image of Kingman and Heritage uh, Islands in the Anacostia River. In Washington D.C., Washington has now joined the network, and they have um, have some some iconic uh, green spaces like Rock Creek Park. But they are also really taking on the challenge of of, of celebrating, rediscovering, and restoring uh, uh, places like this. And it's a it's a wonderful story. They're actually uh, using the the biophilic uh, moniker as a way of um, understanding these spaces. There's a there are going to be a series of outdoor classrooms and. There's a lot of wet, wetlands restoration and native rice uh, species are being planted and it's really a wonderful uh, uh, project. Um, the remaining slides, it's um, I, I thought maybe I'll sp another 10 minutes uh, or so, um, it, it, a quick survey of what some of our other cities are doing. I'm hoping you're still able to hear me. Uh, Edmonton, Canada um, is has join the network, a wonderful story of a city committed to uh, developing itself around eco an ecological network, this kind of um, e eco network uh, approach. I know Edmonton and Victoria have a relationship. Um, Grant Pearsell, I know, has been been there. Uh, it's a wonderful story for us about how you design uh, roads and other kinds of infrastructure to take into account wildlife. So they, they've um, adopted, I think they've built now their 27th wildlife uh, passage. It's really a great story. Um, as I mentioned, there is a film about it on our YouTube channel. Uh, the latest chapter in the Edmonton story is this, um, this city initiative called Breathe, which is really much more comprehensive. It's about, about the ecological network, but also about a, a network of, of spaces they call the Celebration Network and also a, a network of spaces they call wellness, the wellness networks, a celebration of um, squares and public spaces uh, for events. And, and the wellness is, is, is about bicycling and walking and the health, the, the kind of ways that you can be outside and be healthy, be healthful. So here is uh, the ecology network overlay. Here is the celebration uh, network overlay. And uh, this is all online if you want to find it, but the wellness uh, network um, as well. So really comprehensive view of the green network in that city. Uh, we've also been impressed with uh, how they've endeavored to get people out of, um, out, out of buildings and outdoors during the winter, which is a very, can be a very pretty harsh time in Edmonton. So they've actually developed a winter strategy um, that gets folks outside and includes a uh, places to see, things to see, like their ice castle that they build every year, big event. Um, and lots of cities have freeways. Edmonton has uh, embraced this idea of freezeways, that you might be able to skate uh, from home uh, to work. Um, that's pretty interesting. And, and by the way, uh, a set of winter design guidelines for uh, how you design built environments to, to shield winter winds and, and you know, warming stations and place, things like that that will make it easier and more enjoyable for people to be outside. Uh, Pittsburgh has also joined our network. Um, it, just a few things that, that Pitt, Pittsburgh is thinking about. Uh, it's tree forest uh, canopy coverage. They're, they're proud of 42%, which is pretty pretty high. Uh, efforts to get people down 
to the river, the three rivers in that city, new parks like the South Shore Waterfront Park that provide that direct contact with water, but are also resilient parks and, uh, sub, and, and do well in flooding events. So there's a, a resilience agenda here as well. Mayor Peduto um, uh, receiving our certificate. Um, and there's a lot more information on our webpage about the requirements for joining the network. If you're interested, there are uh, certain minimum things that cities have to do to be a part of the network. Uh, Rotterdam, we're hoping we'll join the network as well. Very interesting story of a city, a uh, very watery, water-based city, uh, dealing with how to manage um, sea level rise and flooding uh, and stormwater and using a, a, a nature, a variety of, of um, nature-based solutions to address those problems, including uh, em embracing uh, rooftop, green rooftops, and, and one of my favorite ideas uh, this notion of a water plaza, designing spaces that are important additions to public space, um, but also retain water, also designed to to retain stormwater. And this is this is another story we tell in the, in our Blue Cities uh, film, and also permeable paving, and again investing in trees and greenery uh, for for all the many reasons, um, but for retaining stormwater um, primarily. So uh, this is a, a global movement. We have lots of stories, emerging stories of cities uh, in other parts of the world, like China, Chengdu, one of those places we've been having conversations, wonderful story of their, uh, their connected green ring that circles their city, um, a connected network of wetlands and green spaces. And um, they haven't joined yet, but we're hopeful that they, but they will. Austin, Texas uh, is joining the network and uh, they uh, are, uh, we're quite impressed, continue to be impressed with how committed they are to nature. Uh, they've become a bit famous for their million and a half Mexican free-tailed bats. Um, hundreds of people, thousands sometimes line up during the summer months to see them emerge. Uh, from underneath the Congress Avenue Bridge. Uh, thanks a lot to this guy on the left, Merlin Tuttle, who uh, started something called Bat Conservation International. Uh, it's a major attraction for the city. Tourists come to see the bats, and uh, there are two or three bat-watching dinner cruises uh, that go up and down the lower Colorado River. Uh, it's really quite, uh, quite a big deal. And they have done other things, though, um, and we've we've uh, it's been really good to be to have them in the network. They are particularly have been particularly focused on children and nature, and part of the Children and Nature Network. They've just adopted a Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights, which is really interesting. Um, and they've also been uh, rethinking the what they call school parks. These places they have where you have schools, but you also have adjacent parks and uh, greening those, those school parks and, and deciding where in the city to, to invest in this greening based on equity. So they've developed a nature equity map to decide, to identify those, those neighborhoods that are maybe lower income or minority neighborhoods that are underserved when it comes to, to nature. So we've actually seen a number of our cities develop some kind of uh, nature equality, nature equity um, indicator or, or map. And here's a, another uh, there, a series of, of uh, overlays associated with this equity map. Um, we do believe in wildness in cities. Uh, this, these are images from Richmond, Virginia. We've started a, a dialogue with them about uh, biophilic planning. Um, this is the James River. It's really a wonderful story of a city reconnecting to this wild river class four uh, rapids, um, Heron Rookery, a b beautiful, amazing river that is just a few hundred feet uh, from uh, from a, a pretty dense downtown. So we like to say that uh, we judge the progress maybe of, uh, of biophilic cities in a different way. Uh, the image on the right from Wellington, New Zealand, a wonderful story many of you know about Zealandia, the effort to bring back native species of birds by erecting a, a predator-proof uh, fence. Um, but I love the tagline, bringing birdsong back to Wellington. So if we could imagine a metric that every neighborhood ought to have, um, ought to hear, residents ought to be able to hear native birdsong, that's a, a, a pretty good uh, indicator of success and, and of what a biophilic city is. We have a lot of stories of our cities that are developing new ways to connect residents to the nature around them and new approaches to mapping, for example, 
St. Louis has just released their Connecting with Nature map. Uh, here it's it's online, but it's also a, a, a hard copy physical map that you can unfold. It has a lot of those um, butterfly gardens that I mentioned. Wellington has uh, using Story Map uh, to they've developed this wonderful online map of nature, uh, categorizing there's a, a typology of the different kinds of nature experiences and where you can find them in the city. Uh, living nature, for example, is of course one green roofs and and street trees and community gardens. Uh, but it's also nature activities, places where you can engage nature, you can enjoy nature, you can learn about nature. And it's also um, biophilic designs that may not be actual living nature, but the shapes and forms of nature, images of nature. And Wellington has a wonderful uh, history of designing things like this, um, street bollards uh, in the shape of fern fronds and uh, even, you know, things as utilitarian as trash cans, everything seems to carry uh, a reference to nature. Um, it is interesting to see how some cities have encouraged the things like murals. And even though this is not living nature, it does enhance the, it, it is, does make neighborhoods and cities more natureful. So this is a big, oh, beautiful mural in Fremantle, Western Australia. Fremantle, this old port city, uh, just joined our network, and they have a, a 1% for art, for public art uh, uh, ordinance that, that goes to funding things like this. Numbat is, by the way, their, their state um, animal, and uh, it's an endangered species. There's Luis. I thought about taking this slide out, but I thought, uh, no, um, leave, it, leave it in, and uh, I, I'm assuming Luis is somewhere in the audience or somewhere nearby. Um, but uh, there's that first, that an interior green ring, wonderful to hear uh, the progress being made. Okay, I'm coming to the, to the end, uh, I promise, um, maybe another five minutes. Uh, Oslo, wonderful story, uh, two thirds of that city is in protected forest, a third of the other third densifying uh, this vision of uh, daylighting and restoring the major rivers that run from the forest to the fjord, wonderful network of uh, trails, um, urban trails. Uh, Milwaukee uh, in, in the U.S., another of our partner cities, wonderful story of how to take spaces, leftover spaces, and turn them into gardens and gathering spaces and to repurpose them. Alice's Garden is one of those uh, uh, stories uh, in an underserved neighborhood. This is about growing food, about creating jobs, about creating spaces for uh, learning, for classes, for for um, uh, community events, uh, wonderful uh, story. Uh, the city has adopted a program called Homegrown, which is about taking vacant lots, combining them, and creating new pocket parks. And this is one of them, Ezekiel Gillespie Park. It's a beautiful park. Um, it used to be a couple of vacant lots. There is Singapore. Sing uh, I know Lena will talk more about park connectors, but uh, uh, wonderful, you know, um, inspiration for a lot of us that you can densify, you can grow uh, in terms of population, and, and you can grow vertically, you also protect that nature, expand that nature, extend that nature. Um, San Francisco, I mentioned, is also in the network, and they have become famous for park parklets and, and the very small spaces in that city that have been converted to, to back to nature. Uh, Jane Martin, uh, who's an activist and designer in, in San Francisco, helped create something called a sidewalk landscape permit, which lets uh, residents in San Francisco apply to get permission basically to take up portions of hard surface of, of asphalt, of sidewalks, and to plant gardens. And it's a wonderful idea, and it's a wonderful uh, story. Okay, I'm coming to the end. Uh, Wellington, New Zealand, um, I mentioned this idea of blue biophilic cities, and so many of our cities, Singapore included, um, have a water context. And uh, we're worried um, about sea level rise, and we have lots of places like Rotterdam and other cities that are um, taking actions to adapt to sea level rise. But at the same time, it's a, it, it, there is wonderful opportunity. We, many cities like Wellington beginning to recognize that the nature, much of the nature, much of the most important nature they have around them is, is marine nature. So they have been aspiring to developing a, net, a, a strategy for blue belts um, including the Wellington Harbor, which you see here, that would uh, complement and connect with their green belts. They have a green belt, one green belt that goes back to 1840 town plan. 
So it's a wonderful story as well. Um, so I hope that uh, uh, my assignment to you all um, would be to take a look at the Biophilic Cities uh, webpage. Um, we're delighted again that Victoria has been such an early leader and um, has been in our network and, and been collaborating from the start. Um, we'd love to expand the network, of course, and we've gotten a new Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant. Uh, we, we have some new targets, so we, we need your help in expanding our, our network and expanding the reach of the network. The last thing I will say is that we do have a, a new, relatively new 2017 book. There's an earlier book called Biophilic Cities. Uh, but a newer book, Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design, that has chapters on uh, many of our original partner cities. There's a chapter about Singapore, chapter on Victoria, but also Birmingham in the UK, uh, San Francisco, Milwaukee, uh, a number of, of cities, and uh, about uh, 40 uh, shorter cases of, of projects and innovative ideas in cities around the world. So. I think that's it. I'm going to hope that you're still there um, if I can find you. Gracias, um, Timothy. Thank you. Okay. Ha sido muy interesante.